Welcome, everybody. We're here again with Hamming on Hamming, Learning to Learn. And our lecturer today, our speaker, is Bert Noblock, who is going to talk to us about everybody's favorite topic, quantum mechanics. Please, Bert. Okay, 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 okay. Thank you, Don. Here we are. I hope everybody can read me. Probably, and not Chavi is like I sounded last time. So yeah, I've got this favorite topic, quantum mechanics, and I chose this topic because I totally don't know anything about this. Well, I didn't know, no, I, I know a little bit. And yeah, having went through the lecture of this quantum mechanic topic with his incredible experience and experiences in many scientific domains and as usual with uh, nice private anecdotes and as he said as it was true some decades ago and is still fact today we do not know anything about at least 90 percent of the matter of the universe so quantum mechanics is an uh, incredible complex topic and hardly to understand but nonetheless the theory was precise enough to become well established today and of course there are still so many things we do not understand even with these new theories but a lot of non-explainable uh, and non-provable became clearer in physics we were able to went a huge step closer to the truth and they discovered new areas or how Sheldon Cooper would say, I like Sheldon Cooper. They are closer to tear the mask off the nature and stare at the face of God. He said, I like him. So nevertheless, since quantum mechanic is that complex with theories, even Hemming did not entirely understand. Hemming explained not quantum mechanics itself, Rather, he channeled the student's attention to the why it was created. And he said, science never tells you why, it tells you what. I have deliberately told already many things that I do not know. And I tell you frankly, I'm not going to give you answers. My job is to make you think. So, he started with Max Planck. Max Planck went after some of those symbols which were indicating that something was not right. Some of those theories did not fit to, to a behavior he exposed. Max Planck tried to find out more about the black body radiation. Everybody knows this black body radiation today. If you heat up a rod, it changes the color from dark to dark red and moves gradually up to the white heat. And in order to find more information, Max Planck collected many data by conducting even more trials and fitted this data under a curve. When you recognize that the entire data was fitting perfectly, he understood immediately that there must be more. This could not be simple by chance. Besides hundreds of ways which did not work, I, I think so, he tried to break things up to a bunch of the energy pack sizes and then tried to take a limit. And every time he took the limit, the distribution disappeared. And when he left the limit of final size, he had those exact distribution. So he found apparently that energy occurs in pieces, discrete chunks, because that was what fitted it there. Later, later connected Einstein. It was around about 1905, I think, with photoelectric effect. He showed that when you shine light to a metal, and when you get a certain frequency, the metal will emit photons or electrons. Otherwise, not. He showed that light consists of discrete particles with equal energy, but also with a frequency of the energy proportional 
to Planck's constant, h. And that clearly indicates that those particles also had a wave behavior. So Bohr catched on this and stated later a straight model. It was the atomic model which looked very much like the solar system. He extended his model with some additional theories later and got a very close hit by explaining the emitted light. A little bit abstract spoken, each electron holds a specific energy level and it is moving with a specific speed influenced by this energy and is moving at a specific orbit around the nucleus. In order to be stable, which everything in nature is trying to be or trying to reach, the electron has to have a specific amount of energy. If some circumstances transfer more energy to the system, the system is transmitting energy or gots me energy, the electron jumps it from its current orbit to the next or even downwards. And in order to be stable at this new orbit, the electron emits the energy discrepancy in form of light. So this was his theory. But there have been some discrepancies as well. It fitted quite good, but not at all. To sum it up, while the electron was moving around the nucleus, the electron should have radiated energy and finally should collapse. Should be collapsed. Although it was proved by a lab experiments, nowadays it should have been obviously that it was wrong. Since atoms do not collapse by themselves after a certain amount of time, so, but afterwards, we are always smarter, right? So, anyway, yeah, anyway, because of that, two other people started working on new ideas, Heisenberg and Schrödinger. I pronounced the names of both in German because they were German guys. Schrödinger and Heisenberg. Yeah, Heisenberg uh, catched on Einstein's idea of only dealing with those, those, those things, sorry, you could measure. He started writing down arrays of spectral lines and other things he could measure and stated the first quantum theoretical mechanic based on matrices. In his first paper, he named it quantum theoretical mechanics. Later in his second and third paper about his theory, he used still up-to-date name quantum mechanics. No? So um, it, seems, uh, it seemed to have a certain affinity to the classic mechanics since he has developed Heisenberg's movement equations were some, something similar to the classic Hamilton's movement equations. But anyway, while he was trying to find a well-fitting theory, Schrödinger thought a different way and tried to find a solution with the observed wave characteristics by the boy. Pro, pro, oh, how, how is this called? The Broyer. I, I, I um, call him this way. He stated this theory of the wave mechanics in 26 by using the Hamilton operator. Because of this wave mechanics equation, it was possible to explain the spectra of hydrogen atom and later many further characteristics of other atoms. Beside some theories Heisenberg stated in the meantime, he finally created the uncertainty relation in uh, 27 and showed that it is not possible to describe two characteristics of, particular, uh, of particle equally detailed at the same time. His equations and Finally, the entire theory was adopted as the expression of the wave characteristics of matter and became a foundation of the Copenhagen interpretation. In these years, yeah, in these years, many theories came up, all differently describing the same phenomena, all different in the way they, that they were trying to explain it. But besides the difference of it, Many of, uh, many of them were right, but not only one. So we started with the real mechanics in the middle of this slide. Everything was impressively correct in this time. 
and we could adapt the over hundreds of years established and proven rules of Newton's mechanics to a variety of things. His rules have predicted incredibly large things like planets and also very, very small things and small effects like polarized light. So the real mechanics have been proven true for really large things as well as for very small detailed things. But at the end, or actually at both ends, it went wrong. Within some years of 1900, both ends were proven wrong. On the right end, we have the uh, relativi relativity, and on the left side, we have the quantum mechanics. But it had to. The problem is that uh, the usually that we usually deal with very large things and we are used to think for those large things. But quantum mechanics is concerned with incredible small things like atoms, the inner of atoms, and nowadays the spins, which are the inner of those protons and neutrons, those uh, subatomic particles, electrons as well. If you would like to feel kind of insignificant and small, I post a 50 second video in the chat and considering that you can imagine how small the things are the quantum mechanics are concerned with. But uh, Newton knew it or suspected at least that light was particles. He knew that there had to be some wave like motion because he knew about his uh, Newton's rings and I do not mean his belly. And there were other things which would light had its fits. It fitted together that sometimes it was reinforced and sometimes it was dark. So he knew about this. And Hemming said, when he read, he read uh, Newton, Newton was favoring the particle theory. But as I said before, although some theories are contrary, it does not mean that either one is true and the other is, right, uh, is wrong. And same is within the quantum mechanics. If light falls on a photographic plate, it falls right there and develops that grain. But on the other hand, the two slip experiments show the wave behavior. Since this topic is not only the only one today, I will a little bit speed up, I see. Briefly spoken, since today's education is pretty good overall, and we are able to explain so many things. We got used to, thought, to the thought that we already need, uh, know almost everything and the science can explain everything. But unfortunately, not. Both theories are partly or entirely true. Both patterns were proven, at least with the davison germer experiment. There is a duality of those contrary wave and particle characteristics. And, is it, and as it is written on the slide, almost every scientist will explain it with, I cannot explain this, you will got used to it. And yes, I can understand this. Some things are way ahead of our rudimentary brains compared with the complexity of the nature and incredible dimensions and variety of the, no, in the universe. We are small, small-minded. Besides some personal inconveniences, there were many mysterious things about the Copenhagen interpretation. And uh, therefore it was not accepted by everybody or clearly spoken hardly anyone of the important scientists. Einstein particularly, De Broglie, Paul, and others more or less rejected the Copenhagen interpretation. There were simply too many mysterious things. First of all, the whole idea, the whole, whole idea of what of what the particles were in the matrix or the wave. On the one hand, they later found out that the square of the wave function, or better 
uh, spoken, the absolute value of this square is the probability that it will be at some place. And on the other hand, the square of the composed matrix, uh, the composed of the matrix, where the probability of lives. So, okay, um, if it is not clear what I mean and what Hemming said, and it wasn't clear for me, both showed that the square will lead to or is the probability. But both lead to a different interpretation of the word probability. And there is that there were two different things. One described or defined the probability of an one unique event and the other of the probability of a bunch of different events. So Dirac observed that uh, when one photon goes through the two slit experiment, it interacts with itself without other photons. He decreased the light intensity that low that it was only one photon and he got the same pattern as before. So it was clear that the probability should have been interpreted as the probability of one unique event. But uh, when you read something about uh, some things about quantum mechanics, you will often read both interpretations, Hemming said. They are flipping back and forth. That is because neither Heisenberg, nor Schrödinger, nor all the others were totally sure what they did, and they did not know what they were exactly doing. They developed theories to explain a few things, and they hoped it will explain more as they gradually build up and develop. It's, I guess it's similar to every scientist. And here I like to quote Mr. Hemming again. Mm -hmm. We really do not understand it anyhow. Nevertheless, we are able to use it. And this is one of the points I want to bring up. Even if you cannot or our minds are not wired to understand some phenomena, that does not mean we cannot build a mathematical structure which will enable us to predict reliably. That's roughly what we've done in quantum mechanics. You get used to quantum mechanics, but under pressure, almost everybody, Feynman, certainly, you just have to accept some things you cannot stand, namely the wave particle duality. But is it that wrong to have two different theories describing the same phenomena? Has one of it to be wrong by default? No, in my opinion. By proving the wave function, they struggled again because there is nothing below the probabilistic uh, version of, the, of what the wave function tells you. That probability is particle happen, but there is no mechanical thing below what which got definite, definite. They can't prove it because any proof of that kind of thing must rest on a large number of other assumptions. And you don't prove something with just a few assumptions. Some philosophers, philosophers, this is a very difficult word, try to jump on that and conclude that there has to lay the free will in the quantum mechanics. There are different approaches to explain or to connect the freedom of our actions to this quantum mechanics, to this very small detailed things. And Hemming tried to understand those by, no, but, but neither made it sense to him nor it made sense to me, to be honest. So he spent some thoughts on it by connecting it to the religion. He did not state particularly one, and I won't do it either, but I totally like the, follow, the following thoughts. Either the philosophers, philosophers try to explain some behavior with an infinitely merciful God, for instance, as the most extreme example, the Emerald Buddha, Buddha. It doesn't matter what you did during your lifetime and how evil you lived your life. When you appeal to Buddha, you will go to paradise immediately. By the way, I like it. 
so I have a chance too, you know. But on the other hand, there are some version of religion also trying it with a punishing God. But it will, I, I will not go further. I only liked the thought hemming that you will get the impression that those priests or those minister has got a contract with God. And if he delivers his part, God will deliver, they will deliver his part. Certainly in other religion, it's pretty clear that uh, if you give enough money, they do a little, some and enough religious, religious, you know what I mean, things, and your grandmother will uh, now go up to heaven immediately. It's a contract job, but it doesn't matter. The key point is that if you go that deep into those small detailed things of the quantum mechanics, your interpretations of the behavior or the theories you choose to explain this behavior will be influenced by what you think about God, the free will or the nature. The most awkward theory some philosophers tried to establish was called psychophysical parallelism. An idea that the physical world on the one side and the separate psychological world would be in, on two parallel tracks and there is no interaction between them, but they are influencing each other. So they try to connect the question about the influence of God to the behavior deep down within the molecules and the quantum mechanics. I do not like it either. But to sum it up, deep down between all those atoms, uh, atoms and the movement of electrons around the nucleus and the bunching and destroying of moving subatomic particles, I do not know what to think. I like the imagination of a merciful God. God, I totally like more the knowledge of having a free will. I chose the word knowledge by intent, but I can also comprehend the idea of randomness. I simply do not know, to be honest. So now, since there were so many which they could not explain satisfactorily, any other scientists did some experiment named a lane aspect and he found a correlation between particles which were not even at the same place. He found that when one spins are in one direction, that the spins of the other are in the opposite direction. This sounds incredibly weird, but before you start rolling your eyes and um, carrying this idea to dig, I'd like to say it's true. I will give you a realized example in a few minutes. Okay, furthermore, in uh, quantum mechanics, one believes that the measurement determine, uh, determines before that there is a probability distribution, but the measurements itself puts it in a defin uh, definite state. The theory is very difficult to be honest, considered, but most famous theory or the, the worst famous theory, when it's a real example, is Schrodinger's cat. He has a cat in a box. He has a detector for an electron coming by from some radioactive particle with a 50-50 chance. And if the particle goes by, the Geiger counter drips the poison bottle is up and the cat is dead. If it doesn't trip up, the cat will stay alive and you can open the box. And official former quantum mechanics say the cat is neither dead nor alive until you look. And this proves, proves that they are in quantum mechanics. And let me quote here again they are not in a very good shape. The theory of Schrödinger's cat is doing very well, but also creates many, many mysteries. It's hard to understand. Hemming quote finally again, St. Augustine, as he did in his fifth course again. I know what time is it until you ask me, and then I don't know what time it is. I think I know what understanding is, I think I know, I understand something until you ask me. 
I cannot write a program which will do understanding or cope with the, th with the thing. No way. I haven't a glimmer of idea of how to write a program which can cope with the word understand. Yet, I'm reasonably confident that I understand something. And you are reasonable cope to understand some things. Well, we are in a bad way. We don't know, uh, we don't really know what we are doing. So finally, I promised an example of the proved non-local effect. The example uses the potentially hugely useful quantum phenomena where two particles are inseparable linked across space and time. A couple months ago, they created the first working, working quantum radar. It's, it's absolutely impressive. Observer from all over the world had to admit that, I have to uh, look in the notes, Basanier and his colleagues of the Institute of Science and Technology in, in Austria have been successfully. Ah, thank you, Don. Yeah. <laughs> they used pairs of entangled protons and observed only one side. And when an object came by, of course, staged in the lab, the observed photon changed the state when the, when the quantum en entanglement was broken. I would say influenced, but broken was the word the press used. But as you can see, it is real, not simply a theory. It's a little bit scary, in my opinion, <laughs> especially when I imagine that theor theoretically, anchor proton, this is the original German word, is million over million kilometers away in the universe and can still affect my life here on Earth. But on the other hand, everybody was uh, criticizing the version of Star Trek's beaming. But here we are. My photons, my, my photons are inseparably linked to the same amount of other photons. It's still scary. It is uh, scary. Absolutely. Okay, let me finish with one thought. Since the overall topic is not quantum mechanics, it is learning to learn. Overall, Hemming showed that even something has been proved correct. A contrary way for explaining the same thing has not to be wrong automatically. He gave us some good example within his lecture that something is a, sometimes a big helping of luck is needed to get in touch with uh, somebody, the student he talked about, who has the right thoughts and gives you the next lead to follow a great path. But moreover, he taught that being interested in something, working on it, although there were many, many setbacks and distractors, you can do great things. But he also taught that moral is the heart of this business and he would rather have a high moral team more than any other. And he taught that you do not have to know or understand everything, but you have to be open-minded for new ideas and you have to make yourself and others think about it. And depending on your questions, this would conclude my part and I would hand over to Mike. Bert, thank you. Everybody, uh, I sure is grateful for this and continue to be stimulated. I think that when we look at Hamming's introductions and some of his summaries, you can see some of his most powerful points you've, you've, you've elaborated today, Bert. Things like, in some sense, the course is, is religious. Yeah. In, in an open question is whether there are thoughts, just like dogs can hear things people can't hear, birds can see things, insects that humans can't see. 
there are perhaps thoughts that we can't think. You could see in this lecture, you really bring it home that these were not just imaginary conceptual questions by Hamming, but immediate impacts of the theories of the day. And his lessons learned here and how to cope with that were are really insightful. So thank you for explaining that. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure. All right. Okay, so break time. We'll let the man with the dynamite decide how long. <laughs> Bird, a comment? I would sure, say Marty, go ahead. Yeah. Thanks. At the time that Hamming prepared this course, mm -hmm. he was well into his 70s and he was reflecting on, obviously, lessons learned over almost, you know, 70 years concerning provability. Hamming, at least in the three and a half years I spent with him, struggled, I, I don't know if he struggled, I struggled with provability. I was trying to model a system from the outside, experimentally. And as you recall, or those of you who are interested and want something to help you go to sleep, find my dissertation online. Um, <laughs> but one of the things I had to do for Hamming was if I, I, what is the uniqueness of a model? If you have a very large set of inputs and outputs, let's say it's a single input, single output system, and you have a lot of data consistent without any noise, the perfect ideal textbook example. Mm -hmm and you model the system mathematically, uh, linear, autoregressive, moving average, you pick the model form. Is that model unique? That was the test question Hamming gave me <laughs> because my previous advisor before Hamming challenged me with that same question to say, you have to prove uniqueness. And I went back over thousands of pieces of things in the literature and I was unable to prove uniqueness. Hamming turned it around and used a technique I think he learned from the physicist Richard Feynman at Los Alamos. Because proving a theory is wonderful, but finding something useful that you can't prove is useful. So Hamming left me with the question, Mr. Mandelberg, Sort of like the guy, the guy on, on Matrix, when he calls Mr. Mandelberg. If you can't prove that your model is unique, can you demonstrate at least two cases where it's not? Mm -hmm. Prove the converse. Yeah. Took me two weeks. I came up with the two examples. And Hamming said, good work. Let us continue. It was sort of a trial by fire. Maybe Hamming already knew the answer, but he was a good enough teacher to make me learn to find a counterexample. Another thought that's related, I think, based on my 70 plus years, very few answers are time invariant. The problem that Einstein had in 04 and Planck had, by the way, very good presentation. I, I did enjoy it. I learned things, even though I read that once, you've done the digging, thank you. <laughs> thank you. A theory is a human concept to try to describe something we are observing. As Don said, we have limited frequencies of eye, ear, you know, birds can hear things, dogs can hear things we can't do. Let me bring it to a close. Hamming says, maybe computers have thoughts that we can't understand. Boy, wow, leading into AI. But it comes down to the point I'd like to make for your thought. A theory is a useful paradigm to help you today. Mm -hmm. How many theories have we had about what does the Earth rotate around or what rotates around the Earth? Yeah. How many theories have we had on astrophysics or the many fields all of you are involved in 
well past the time I stopped learning new things. I stopped learning new things maybe 15 years ago. You guys are 15 years ahead of me. And your theories are of some value today and maybe of different value in 15 years. So don't get hung up. That's the classical mathematics when you're theory driven. Applied mathematics is, is it useful? Don just said, yeah, there are thoughts we are incapable of thinking. HAL 2001 Space Odyssey. Don, I can't, I can't do that. I can't open the pod bay door. It'll violate my principles because she'll kill me. Do not get wired on the theory. Too many pure physicists and pure mathematicians got round, wrapped around the theory. If that's what you love, go make new theories. But most of us in this room, I think, are more applied. Mm -hmm. If it's useful, use it. Hamming says mathematics is a wonderful thing, but it shouldn't uh, fall in the way, uh, it shouldn't get in the way of obtaining useful results. If you can obtain the useful results without using closed form math, hello, artificial intelligence, hello, heuristics. Yeah. Hamming says, don't let math get in your way. That's all I had. Good presentation. Thank you. The, uh, like the Austrian, lot. the half of me that's Austrian says, thumbs up. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, then uh, I will have a two minute break and I will be back soon. Yeah, how about five to set good? Toby, can you set the clock for us? All right, thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, Bert. I think I sucked up five minutes of your time. Hey, Toby, how are you doing? No, no, I enjoyed it. Thank you. I appreciate it. So I do expect that periodically we'll have an event. And I'll invite you all. You're welcome to come back speak or talk about something if you decide that you want to at some point. Fair enough, Lauren? Yeah, uh, and I think in, in the long term for this class, several of the things that Hamming talked about are awful long in the tooth. They were highly relevant then. They're interesting as a little bit of look back now, but the field has moved far enough. It could be an, an interesting next leap on the class to maybe take a third or a half of those of the presentations overall and not spend class time going over them or intentionally shorten them, but then have discussion and or presentation on the world as it moved forwards and thinking about what might Hamming be saying about those particular topics if he was talking in the 2020 that he was targeting. Because a few of them are, you know, they have moved on. And one of them that, that's hitting me, because I've been trying to read some more on quantum computing and such, is the quantum field in the last six months has made some rather spectacular mathematical head slaps where there just been the good old fashioned don't oh, what, what what have we done and you know it's been around things that oh well we ignored half of the math of special relativity oh what happens when we don't ignore half the math so now there's people who are actually starting to come up with real descriptions of wave particle duality and that they're not wave particle duality. It's that you have this other half of math that we've been ignoring. And if you use the other set of equations, it works kind of like Maxwell's equations. If you only use two of them, they don't work very well. But if you use all four, that's fine. Well, in order to use all four, you have to buy into using the irrational plane, the complex plane. Well, in order to make some of this quantum stuff work and not be pure freaking magic, it turns out that the superluminal equations in 
special relativity can't be ignored. And when they do, they're, now they're building the math that's taking out a lot of the old assumptions. And there's some really interesting interpretations in what does this mean and, and how do you think about it? And that's stuff that, you know, that's hot bleeding edge science, mathematician stuff going on. Um, and it speaks to a lot of the things that Hamming's talked about because then you can go, well, well gee, in the last 30 years, what well, took us so long to get there? I'll stop there. Thanks. Please uh, replay that and embellish next week because one of the things I'll be putting in front of everybody will be, well, maybe one way for this to be a self-directed class yet measurable, which uh, Toby will make us smarter about. Measurable is uh, to have participants give their own talk. And it might be a mix of what does what did Hamming say, what was he teaching us, and where has the field gone since then? So it's interesting to think that we might be creating a whole pile of videos at some point for people to consider.